words which might make this operation possible. The United States can provide the air cover and the Kurds can provide the ground troops. Now, it's obvious they've got to be armed. They've got to be given the sinews of war, modern weapons. These gallant Kurdish fighters and gallant women fighters uh, have got this uh, capability. We're also reading in October, the United States deployed 12 A-10s at Incirlik in Turkey and dropped 50 tons of ammunition to the YPG-led Syrian Democratic Forces. So in other words, not everything the U.S. does here is bad. Uh, and in particular, the U.S. military has announced that it will deploy up to 50 special operations forces to PYD. Now, PYD, YPG, same thing. The PYD is the political arm and the YPG is the, uh, the military arm. To YPD-controlled territory, presumably to aid with the future Raqqa offensive. Okay, so you get it. There's a certain concentration of, uh, of things going on. We have got to demand on social media, uh, in every possible way, put pressure on Obama, order the U.S. military, crisp orders to the Pentagon saying, boys, you are going to interdict the Jarablus to Afrin corridor. This is the big issue. We've got to develop a, a drumbeat of indignation that this has not been done. Now, the obvious, the obvious way to do it is U.S. and Kurds, because those are the ones who have done it, uh, for example, in Kobane, right? There's, a, there's an established pattern of cooperation between the U.S. on the one side and the Kurds on the other. And, of course, even Obama now sees that this stuff about the moderate terrorists, this was ridiculous. Get the Kurds. The Kurds are effective. The Kurds are not fanatics. They have these women fighters. They're diverse. They have everything you need, right? You can make you can make yourself into a um, a hero. Uh, now, of course, that's not the only way. I want to call on President Putin of Russia. My call to President Putin is: if the U.S. doesn't immediately close that gap, then Russia should do it with the Kurds, without the Kurds, any way at all. We'll get to this in a second. Back on World Crisis Radio, Radio Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So you see the idea. There is this limited territory, 60 miles across. It can be blocked. It can be done from the air to a large extent. It's going to be much more efficient if you have modest ground forces. Now, you do have this problem of Erdogan, the mad madman of Istanbul. Um, Erdogan has just had an election. The principal fact about this election is vote fraud, unfair election practices, massive ballot box stuffing, and all the rest. Uh, there was, for example, a press conference given by one of the observer teams from the European Union. The chairman of this was, I believe, Swiss, and his conclusion was this was not a fair election. You had the police going after the opposition. You had that huge bomb blowing up a bunch of pro-Kurdish leftist uh, activists and so forth. Here, Daniel Pipes, <laughs> the neocon, Daniel Pipes, writing in the National Review, right, reactionary Buckleyite, Daniel Pipes says he's stunned, stunned by the fact that Erdogan uh, was actually able to get uh, almost 50 percent of the vote. Uh, and although that's that's not enough to you need 60 percent to change the Constitution, he's going to pick up 60 percent with the help of these uh, sort of, uh, you know, block parties, these these, uh, you know, lesser formations that he can uh, that he can maneuver. So uh, they're going to have a, di a dictatorship. In other words, they, they put it very delicately on NPR that you're going to have a presidential republic with a very strong presidency. And of course, they say, like the U.S. No, it's not like the U.S., because in the U.S. we have checks and balances, right? We have a whole complicated system, uh, which has actually uh, served us well up until maybe recently. But in the case of uh, Turkey, it's going to be a presidential republic with no checks and balances. It's going to be the uncontrollable, running wild 
uh, dictatorship of Recep Tayyip Erdogan. So not fair. Vote fraud. It's going to be a one-party state. Uh, now, uh, as I said, Russia. We can understand perfectly, and we sympathize and support what Russia has done up to now, it is essential, of course, to stabilize the Assad government, to stabilize the re region around Latakia. The Russians have to defend their air base there. Uh, but that is now, you know, a, a month and a week that this has been going on. We say it is time, we could even say it's high time that Russia with its very effective air force, which uh, has excited the admiration of the world, Russia must turn its attention to the Jarablus to Afrin corridor and start bombing and start preventing the money from coming in, the ammunition from coming in, the fuel from coming in, the fanatical recruits from coming in, and by the same token, prevent the stolen oil which is being shipped out by the son of Erdogan, who is the principal oil smuggler on the scene, and of course the wounded terrorists who are then taken up into a hospital by the daughter of Erdogan. So uh, if the U.S. and the Kurds can do it, that's great. Again, if, if, the, if the lunatic uh, war party here is still too strong, the neocons and so forth, then Russia and the Kurds, one would hope, could do it. And as I pointed out in uh, in Germany, uh, there has been German rearmament, you know, in the 1950s. It happened. There's now a Bundeswehr. There's now a German army, of all things. Uh, there's also a German navy. And it would not be too hard uh, for Germany to simply uh, say, we have a paramount national interest here at stake, and we want to uh, send in those forces, right? The Bundeswehr is going to stretch itself along that 100-kilometer uh, corridor and make sure that nothing gets in or out. Uh, the small strip, as Nadia Bilbasi of El Arabiya put it, right? Or this uh, this other guy, this other group writing in the uh, in the Financial Times, right? But of course, you heard it first here, right? 12 hours ahead, 14 hours ahead of the Financial Times, you heard it. Uh, from me. But now the point is stir the pot, get the buzz going. Let's talk about it. Now, there's also this complicating factor. A Russian uh, civilian airliner, Airbus, with 225 people on board has been destroyed. And there is now this tug of war between those who say this was a bomb and those who say this was a uh, an un unexplicable uh, event so far. I would simply say this. I think it, it is. It's likely to me that it's a bomb, but it's it's likely that this is some kind of a uh, an operation by terrorists, ultimately depending on the NATO bureaucracy, to come in there and give Russia uh, a hard time. So uh, that has now led, I think, uh, wisely. President Putin has cut off, stopped all Russian flights to Egypt. That, that should not go on too long, but there must be a way to essentially clarify this issue. The United States, above all, must arm and support the YPG, and they must administer to Erdogan a decisive rebuff. Erdogan, back off. United States paramount national interest requires that that part of the border be shut down, interdicted, and since you won't do it, you won't do it with your Turkish forces on the northern side of that border. It's going to have to be done on the south side of the border. So uh, that is our situation. Get that map. Take a look at Jarablus on the Euphrates. And again, they, the Kurds tried to take it in the last 10 days. Now, there's also a history involved in this, uh, which I highlighted in one of our uh, briefings. I guess it's the Friday briefing. Uh, sorry, the Saturday briefing. And this has to do with the fact that this uh, total control by the Kurds of the entire Turkish-Syrian border all the way to Jarablus, that was accomplished essentially with a kind of a spring-summer offensive by the Kurds, April, May, June, July, which uh, is was focused on the town of... 
let's see here. Uh, it's a town along the uh, the way. Uh, tell, hang on. It's a. Uh, it, it, it turned out to be the key to this uh, to this entire thing. Tell Abiyad. T e l a b y a d. Now that was the big battle of this past summer, and when the Kurds won that battle, we are told that it was absolute hysteria among the Erdogan people in uh, Ankara. They went nuts, uh, began issuing ultimatums. Uh, for example, the uh, I think we have some some choice quotes from the um, from the Turkish uh, press at the time. They were saying, uh, Kurdish state in the making in northern Syria with U.S. assistance. I wish. Kurdish ethnic cleansing of Arabs and Turkmens. Ridiculous. Corridor opening to move northern Iraq oil to the Mediterranean. Look, they let that out of the bag. This is from the AL Monitor, June 22nd, 2015. Corridor opening to move northern Iraq oil to the Mediterranean. <laughs> so that's Erdogan's son. Doing that, so he's getting hype in the Turkish press, and of course, the, the Turkish theme is the Democratic Union Party, right? YPG or uh, these other uh, 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 initials that we have, uh, more dangerous than ISIS, absolutely ridiculous. So that is what gave the Kurds the control all the way to Jarablus, and that's exactly when Allen. John Allen went into action with Erdogan saying, wait a minute, we're going to stop the Kurds from getting in there. We're going to make that into a safe zone for terrorists with a NATO air cover over it. So that game has to end. Back to the minute on World Crisis Radio. Back to World Crisis Radio. So the entire world needs to focus and to some extent is focusing on this critical stretch, right? This, this narrow corridor, this couloir, we might say, uh, that goes from Jarablus on the Euphrates to Afrin, close to the Mediterranean. There is, even beyond, on the other side of the Afrin corridor, there's, a, there's another stretch of Turkish-Syrian border area, but that doesn't lead into anything. That leads into a kind of cul de sac. It leads into just an area which is surrounded on all sides by uh, pro-Assad forces. Uh, and I think some there have been some Russian attacks there. So again, we understand what Russia has done up to now. But at this point, it is time. It is imperative. World public opinion must demand that the United States help the Kurds do it or that Russia help the Kurds do it. And if that doesn't happen, I think that's going to be a uh, tragedy and it will lead to many uh, questions being asked. And then again, if none of that works, Germany would have to say, we don't want to be inundated by this tragic situation, the wave of displaced persons and refugees and so forth. We've got to do the humanitarian thing, which is to allow these people to stay in their homes, not to face the rigors of this of this uh, Calvary-like uh, trip of hundreds and hundreds of miles. We're going to go in there and seal that border area, and uh, we're going to make sure that ISIS withers on the vine within a matter of weeks, a month, I would say, at the very most. Now, just a couple of things about what, what sort of an area is this, right? Um, the YPG, the good Kurds, because uh, good Kurds, there are the Barzani Kurds in northern Iraq. They're not so good Kurds. Then there's the PKK. That's sort of the middle uh, rank of the Kurds. But the good Kurds are the YPG. They entered Tel Abyad with the support of the U.S. Air Force and of Arab fighters such as Burkan al-Firat. They control a contiguous 180-kilometer or 110-mile stretch from Rasal Ain to Jarablus. So the border of South Kurdistan to the Euphrates at Jarablus, the YPG controls 400 kilometers, 250 miles of border. The next potential target, the target that we're talking about right now, is the line from Jarablus to Afrin, 
110 kilometers or 68 miles by their count. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm doing as the crow flies and they're doing uh, through, uh, through